says it. This is the answer. It says here that a bolt of lightning is going to strike the clock tower precisely 10.04 p.m. next Saturday night. If we could somehow harness this lightning, channel it into the flux capacitor, it just might work. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future. Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well, and welcome to my latest video essay, in which I'll be talking about one of my favourite movies of all time, that being Back to the Future. Now I know it's been a short while since I've posted a video on my channel, but in recent weeks, I felt a little burnt out to say the least. So I used this time to really think about what my next video should be about, and no sooner did I see Back to the Future on TV, did I have the urge to make a video essay. There are so many things that I love about this movie, so without further ado, let's get straight into why I love Back to the Future. Back to the Future might be the best example of a movie where events that are initially set up for the audience don't pay off until much later in the story. It means that as a first time viewer, the scenes in 1985 come across very innocently as we're watching Marty McFly's everyday life as a teenager. Instead, we realise that moments such as Biff being George McFly's boss in 1985 or the failure of the McFly family come into play when we visit 1955 Hill Valley. Hey, I'm talking to you, McFly, you Irish bug. Oh, hey, Biff. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, you got my homework finished, McFly? Uh, well, actually, I figured since it wasn't due till Monday... I Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Anybody home? Hey, think, McFly. <laughs> think. I gotta have time to recopy it. Do you realize what would happen if I hand in my homework and your handwriting? I'd get kicked out of school. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Would you? Well, now, of course not, no, if I wouldn't no. want that to happen. And that's one of the genius aspects of the script by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. Both screenwriters set up story elements that aren't thrown on screen for the sake of looking clever, but are done so with the purpose of keeping the audience engaged throughout its runtime. At just under two hours, this movie is also an example of how to tell your story as efficiently as possible. Just as we're following a day in the life of Marty, the movie quickly brings Doc Brown into the fold, during the Twin Pines Moor scene. The two bobs are quick to remind us that we're watching a summer blockbuster, especially once the DeLorean is revealed to the audience. Bob's makers could have easily got caught up in the sci-fi trappings of the genre, especially with the time travel mechanics. Instead, Zemeckis wisely focuses on the human element of the story, with Marty's interactions with his parents in 1955. What? You're George McFly. Yeah, who are you? The reason why Back to the Future is a beloved movie is because of its simple plot structure. In Act 1, we're introduced to the characters and central conflict of the movie, in which Marty inadvertently travels to 1955. In Act 2, Marty then has to find a younger Doc Brown to help him get back to 1985. At the same time, he has to get his parents to fall in love again after Marty, rather than George, is run over by Lorraine's dad. And in the final act, Marty has to get his parents to kiss at the high school dance and get himself safely home to 1985. While this structure plays out seamlessly in the movie, the two bobs, in my opinion, don't get enough credit in the execution of this wacky plot. Too many sci-fi movies before Back to the Future, and since then, get bogged down with plot exposition and scientific theories, rather than focusing on the story and characters. If you think about it, the scene in which we're introduced to the DeLorean is effectively the only time we explained how the car is able to function as a time travel machine. And even then, Zemeckis is always quick to visually convey as much of the time travel mechanics as possible. What's this? What's this? Tell you, 88 miles per hour! 
I think Back to the Future is one of the best casted movies ever, and that's no exaggeration. For all you cinephiles out there, I'm sure you know the Eric Stoltz story, but just a reminder for those of you who don't know, Stoltz was initially cast as Marty McFly. The story goes that the filmmakers initially wanted Michael J. Fox as Marty, but unfortunately he was working on the hit TV series Family Ties. It wasn't until six weeks into filming, that's right, six weeks, that the two bobs decided that Stoltz wasn't a right fit for the role. The filmmakers then went back to Fox and offered him the role. The studio for Family Ties told the filmmakers that if they were able to fit their filming schedule with his one for the hit TV show, then they would be willing to let Fox do the gig. And sure enough, Fox accepted the role, apparently without even reading the script, which is crazy to say the least. And without a doubt, Michael J. Fox crushes it in the role of Martin McFly. He brings everything you could imagine to the role and more. When we're introduced to the character, we immediately see his youthful, carefree attitude as he blasts the speakers in his garage before playing on his guitar. Fox brilliantly plays to these qualities, while never ever playing it to the point where we don't like his character. But where Fox shines on his performance is when his character travels to 1955. You just totally believe that Marty is completely out of his element in this world. In particular, as Marty arrives in 1950s Hill Valley, Fox perfectly sells the bewildered, confused state of the character. Perhaps the role that gets the most praise is Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown. Given the eccentric nature of the character, Lloyd could have easily gone over the top in his portrayal of Brown. Instead, the filmmakers and Lloyd channel his high energy towards his passion for science and specifically the DeLorean time machine. This creative decision gives Doc Brown a reason for why he acts in this way. Lloyd walks a masterful tightrope of being this wacky scientist while somehow being believable as his character. Leah Thompson is wonderful as Marty's mother, Lorraine. Like Fox, Thompson has a great sense of comedic timing. Specific scenes come to mind, such as when she grabs Marty's knee from under the table, or when she tells Marty that when she kissed him, it was like kissing her brother. This is all wrong. I, I don't know what it is, but when I kiss you, it's like I'm kissing my brother. While her character doesn't have much of an arc compared with George, whom I'll get to shortly, Thompson makes the most of her role as she's endearing and charming. Despite Marty McFly being the lead character of the movie, it's his dad, George, played by Crispin Glover, who is effectively the heart of the movie. Glover's performance is top-notch as he somehow convinces the audience of playing two completely different personas in two time periods. In the 1985 segment of the movie, the writing along with Glover really make you feel sorry for the character as we learn of his lack of self-confidence and inability to stand up for himself. The filmmakers are smart to beat down George at every possible moment, from George being constantly picked on by Biff to not being able to ask Lorraine to the high school dance due to his lack of confidence. And while this kind of writing and direction does feel like beating down the character to a pulp, it does mean that when we see George overcome his fears and fight for what he truly loves for in Lorraine, it makes his triumph at the end of the movie all the more satisfying. <laughs> Are you okay? <gasps> Thomas F. Wilson is brilliant as the high school bully, Biff. Though Biff has a flat character arc, that doesn't stop Wilson from chewing up the scenery. My favorite moments with the character or when we see him being an absolute dick. Hands down, my favourite Biff moment is when he meets George at the diner as he asks the latter if he's completed his homework or not. 
Yeah, not too early. I sleep in Sundays. Oh, mm -hmm. McFly, your shoes are tied. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> don't be so gullible, McFly. Okay. I don't want to see you in here okay. again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. <laughs> On top of looking the part, Wilson also brings a smug, arrogant quality to the role as he proves a worthy adversary to George. Alan Silvestri is one of the best film composers of all time, and I think you can all agree Back to the Future definitely put this composer on the map as he's flourished in the years and decades that have followed. But one note that Robert Zemeckis gave to Silvestri before he wrote the score was to make it sound as big as possible. And man does he deliver with the title theme effectively being another character in the movie. I'm gonna ram. Zemeckis and Silvestri are also wise to not include music for certain scenes, so that the dramatic and comedic elements land harder for the audience. But when Silvestri's score is heard in the movie, it plays up wonderfully, with the score being, in my opinion, one of the greatest of all time. Oh yeah, and Huey Lewis and the News' Power of Love song is one of my favourite movie songs of all time. I mean, come on, how can you not like this song? In short, Back to the Future is that rare movie that ticks every box and then some. Where most time travel movies get bogged down with the mechanics of the plot, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gill focus on the human element of the story. It means that we spend less time focusing on exposition and more time caring for the characters. The care and attention to detail in the story and script is there for all to see. In particular, the two Bobs set up story elements in 1985 that don't pay off until much later which is one of the reasons why this movie is so rewatchable. The efficiency in which the story is told is incredible as we move quickly from the introduction of the cast to the reveal of the MacGuffin of the story in the DeLorean time machine. The cast for this movie is one of the best I've ever seen as every actor plays their roles to perfection. From Michael J. Fox as the cool teen Marty McFly to the zany intelligent performance from Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown, each actor brings their unique acting sensibilities to their roles all in the service of the story being told. Finally, Alan Silvestri's soundtrack holds up to this day as the title theme along with the soundtrack as a whole becomes another character in the movie. So we'll now hand it over to you as I want to find out your thoughts on Back to the Future and what's your favourite scene from the movie as I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below. Also, if you're a big fan of movies like myself, then be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons along with the notification bell to keep up to date with my latest videos. Thank you guys for watching and as always, I'll see you on the next one.